Thank you very much for the introduction, which is longer than my own beginning words. Verena Topf, Anna Speichel and I are very happy to welcome you to share the first interim results of our studies. In the beginning, Matthias Schulze-Kraft said that we work very interdisciplinarily in System Check, and we work with people who work practically. We want to develop recommendations on the basis of workshops and exchange and academic studies. Right now, we're going to tell you about the results of the qualitative study, and we're still in exchange about the quantitative version, still waiting for results. There are certain academic and analysis processes. Matthias said, as though we didn't know already, and Angie Wiedel also made a wonderful analysis. We know this, and academia has different functions. One is, of course, um, legitimation, and then when that comes in, the people who do the practical work say, yes, we knew that already. But ideally, um, academia also has a learning and recognition value. And beyond that, which is known in the field, there is another point of view and a way to bring this into the current debate, adding the social sciences to it talking about things like self-marketing, like self-exploitation. You can also transfer this over to this field. Academia is not only there to confirm that which is already known, but also to shed light on new knowledge. And Hannes Speicher will now start and present the results of the qualitative study. Hello, I'm just going to make sure my tech is set up properly. Great. Independent, self-determined, and with passion. A lot of people could be jealous of the way that they work. And their work is often talked about as a new ideal, but freelance artists aside from the few stars in the art world, live in a way that is very expensive. Their income are low. They are subject to several different risks with no safeguards. In the independent, working in the independent performing arts means, and the keynote speech from Kaya showed this as well, in addition, means working in a field that is precarious due to the competition and the restricted funds available and the huge amount of unpaid work, writing applications, networking. In the quantitative study, we are trying to collect representative data and with a qualitative study to the, for which I'm standing here to talk about the diversity of the working methods and living realities and the recurring patterns in the income biographies as well as the problems perceived by the people in this community. Or to put it more simply, with a qualitative interview study, we're trying to get a first picture of the working and living realities of people who work in the independent performing arts. Today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the first results of the study which appeared online yesterday, which is a joyful small coincidence. And let me give you a small overview. So my presentation is simply found. First, I'll speak technically about the methods and tools. 
then we'll go exploratorially into the difficult social situation of those questioned, um, talk about a subjective feeling of security, how do they combine various forms of employment, uh, and then with points three, four, and five, we're going to give these patterns of interpretation, a subjective feeling of security. Some have no worries, some are careless, and some are concerned. And we'll talk with them about the motivations of continuing to work within the independent performing arts, and with point five, the strategies for overcoming these problems. Exit, voice, and loyalty is the way we've sorted them. We'll do that under point five, and point six will give a little outlook. So, so the methods and sampling. In the study, there were 24 problem-based individual interviews. Um, problem centered from the logics that we developed. We developed guidelines where we had a number of different thematic focuses that were important for our questions. Uh, there were two group interviews made with employees from seven different funding institu institutions. There were also two expert interviews. And one interview with an ableism critical activist, as well as an expert interview with a representative of the Bayerische Versorgungskammer. The goal of the sampling wasn't about quantitative needs, like having representative numbers. We wanted to make sure that we had a certain diversity achieved in the field. So alongside the sociodemographic heterogeneity, um, age, gender, income, to have as many different disciplines within the independent performing arts, theater, dance, circus, puppet theater, musical, a large spectrum, as well as a large spectrum of artistic and non-artistic professions, making sure we talk about technicians, production management, theater education, as well as a wide variety of employments, uh, employment fields, freelancing, hybrid employment, multi-jobbing, mini-jobs. We really tried to cover as much as possible. I didn't bring the matrix with me, the matrix with me, because it's a little bit difficult to see, but yes, we wanted to have as much diversity as possible. Uh, and the focus of the evaluation, we'll go right through these points, A. We were interested in the spectrum of different income constellations and forms of employment. B. The perception of the problems with uh, social safeguarding and work among the interview partners. C, the strategies for dealing with the large amounts of um, work and financial insecurities. And D, their wishes for improvement and ideas in terms of social policies. And now we'll get to the results. Uh, in terms of the forms of employment and dependent employment, like, like hybrid employment, they occurred in various constellations and combinations. So I'll go through these combinations very quickly so that we maintain an overview of where the people we spoke with work. So we have the following constellations uh, from the interviews. First of all, the people work completely as a freelancer exclusively within the independent performing arts. 
13 of the 24 people interviewed are a part of this group. Um, you can find people who both earn very little as well as decently, and, and access to the cost for this group is not a problem. Then we talked to people who work on a freelance basis in multiple fields, artistic and then less artistic work. This was five of the 24 people interviewed, and the spectrum of non-artistic work, teaching, coaching, publishing, fitness, uh, physical services, and the income groups also ranged from low to high. With this group, you've got to also always bear in mind that the secondary, secondary income, they have to be very careful about expanding that too far, or else they'll endanger their membership in the COSCA. Then we have people who are uh, hybridly employed, either synchronously or serially. Those who do it synchronously generally have a part-time employment with um, parallel freelance work. Uh, four of the people we spoke with worked like this, and generally, when, they, when they're when they hybridly employed, generally they are not part of the COSK because, because if they are part-time employed, then they don't need a membership in the COSK. And for the, those who work serially, it was completely underrepresented in my sample. It actually occurs quite frequently. But this also works, for example, with um, guest contracts. Where there are phases of brief part-time employment at repertory and ensemble theaters. And the final model, and I found in the interviews, and this is uh, supplementing one's income through social services, and it's primarily a matter of um, basic, basic security in retirement. And this was someone that we spoke with that was retired but did not have sufficient funds in her retirement. Which can be tricky with the cost because one does not always have an artistic means of earning income that's recognized. Let's talk about the status quo of the, in, uh, of the poor social situations of those we interviewed. The fees that come from projects and residencies, they're calculated so closely to the minimum fee limit that they don't leave any room for additional private safeguarding. The income is low, there's very little security for life planning, family planning, family planning gets pushed and pushed. And aside from the integration in the health insurance and care insurance funds, uh, social safeguarding, despite the cost cost system, is still um, insufficient. The biggest problem in terms of social safeguarding in the eyes of those, those we talked with are low retirement provisions and the risks that must be borne individually in terms of times when there are no, when there are no jobs when work is canceled and during, during illness. And when they have discrimination experiences, it makes it makes the situation worse, of course. And this shows us again how underfinanced the system is. We see that the social situation becomes more precarious the more discrimination that a person is forced to face with. One's own migration background, a non-German family background, uh, different physical abilities. All of these things complicate the situation. All in all, we can see that the biggest problem um, seen by those we spoke, to, spoke with is uh, low income in retirement. 
With one person that we spoke with, the income was uh, 1,200 in retirement. And, and nearly, she received nearly 80% um, from, guest, uh, from guest performances and thus could no longer become a member of the KSK. And she had nowhere near enough money available for retirement. It's a very emotional response that the interview subjects have. There's a discrepancy between the large amount of work and the very low retirement. So a lighting designer, for example, finds the yearly notification from the, from the Deutsche Rentner Physician is an insult. Because in the letter it says, if you keep working like this until you're 67, we won't even be able to pay your rent. Um, an actor calls this notification a real joke, um, heating or eating, but I definitely won't be able to get an apartment. An author and performer reacted cynically and said, yeah, sure, so my retirement notification does not look very good. And now we're getting the perspectives of those we spoke with. What's interesting is that for the people we spoke with, um, that shows the myth that only those who come from well-off families can afford to work in the independent performing arts, but in fact, it's made up of a huge spectrum of people, many of whom can't afford to work in the independent performing arts and yet continue to do it. And now we get to the subjective feelings of security of the people we spoke with. And we were able to differentiate three different typologies. Uh, a is the, is the type with no worries because um, they are taken care of because of assets and ownership. Then they're the careless because uh, th this type is used to poverty, is similar to the historic Bohemians, and those who are concerned we also weren't interested whether the, whether the private assets of the people we spoke with um, were truly enough to safeguard them. The lack of a safeguard network outside of the KSK, which is always seen anyways with a great deal of concern, and there are people who, despite the social insecurity, um, aren't worried, and people who have assets who are still worried about how they survive um, entering retirement. And for people who work purely as freelancers, um, they're primarily the first two um, topologies. The third topology is often people who have side income, auxiliary income. The carefree do reflect upon their privileged position and argue for solutions that make it easier for everyone to be part of the independent performing arts regardless of their origin. But, but one's origin and one's psychological resiliency to deal with the uncertainties are a big part of being able to persist in the independent performing arts. And now we'll get to... And now we come to the motivation for working in the independent performing arts despite all of the challenges. In terms of motivation, the sample divides as follows. There was one group, the the carefree say, say that the independent performing arts is so attractive that they're happy to work in it. But for a fifth of 
the people we spoke with. Very strongly expressed the desire to work in a permanently employed situation. A fifth said, I have to work independently because I don't have any other way of working artistically. And also people with different abilities, the working conditions in the independent performing arts community are the, small, are the smaller evil because they see the institutions being even more ableist. Um, on the other hand, and the, the protagonists find themselves in a free but unfree situation. A uh, production manager says, I can choose for myself how I use my time and when I do what. Uh, I'll quote her, I can decide for myself how I use my time and what I do when. And when the weather's nice, then I don't go into the office. So, and of course that only works sometimes because of course I, I do end up sitting in the office during nice weather because I'm passionate about what I do. And and if you applicate and the application has to get sent in, otherwise the project can't take place. And of course I finish that. But I know why. And I decide. You can really see in the thought process how it becomes clear that this ethos of freedom as a promise, I think it's a very important quote. Another, other important points that we have to talk about for motivation, you already heard in the keynote speeches, that one can decide freely about what the content of artistic work is and to choose the team freely. This is very important, especially for people who have discrimination experiences. All right, I'm probably already running late, but I'm going to try to to speed things up. Four minutes, okay. So the strategy for overcoming these challenges, how do the people do it? Despite, uh, despite continuing to work in the field, despite these challenges, we said exit voice and loyalty, the way that we divided these strategies for overcoming the challenges. Now, some decide just to stay despite all of the worries. People who don't have who don't have a rich family or are supported by their partners, but they are very willing to limit themselves in order to continue working in the field. There. People who have experiences of uh, poverty, especially from childhood onward, they and they simply use resilience to increase their resources. The, it's a reminder, sort of, of the Bohemian movements of the 19th, 20th centuries, where poverty was almost idealized. Uh, performer with physical different abilities who I would characterize as a carefree bohemian. Very clearly shows us how this paradox situation works. She's not concerned at all about her future because she's already experienced poverty. Yeah, I grew up relatively poor, and so I don't really worry, I think that I'll be fine even with a very little, and I have a low, and I have low living standards. And another, another um, very popular strategy, of course, is to simply repress all these questions of insecurity. A lot of people talk, uh, a lot of people get, uh, said that they'd also thought about ending their career. And an alternative to really ending is a professional diversification so that alongside the freelance independent work, they would find part-time employment such as the founding 
of a, an academic pu uh, publishing house or fitness work or coaching. It's important that when people do this, they have to think about, oh, well, this means for my KSK membership. It was very interesting in the news to see what was kept secret, and I asked from the very beginning, do you have any kinds of non-artistic income? And in the initial interviews, often people said no, and then later revealed that they did. And they say, yeah, okay, sure, I, I do work as a coach, or I am also a teacher. And then it, and it became very clear that there's a stigma attached to uh, non-artistic work when one is an artist. So, to sum things up, there's a surprising amount of loyalty to the independent performing arts coming from the combination of the subject uh, of the carefree or the careless and then as well this um, freedom ethic and the cultural capital even if I end up living in one room in a shared apartment that I can barely afford but but hey maybe with this production I'll be able to tour and travel and I'll be able to really participate and take part um, with my career in a way that with my daily economic income I'm not able to take part. And as I said, there's a huge amount of loyalty and those who are concerned are more concerned with figuring out an exit or expanding their secondary income so that they will be safeguarded. And for those that which a permanent empl permanently employed position is the ideal, but everyone we everyone we spoke to wanted greater representation um, in lobbying work what can we take now as an outlook along with a large focus on the recommendations for action that we will uh, formulate during system check. In terms of the question with the means of adjustment by institutions that can allow people to improve the conditions of independent performing arts, um, from the COS, from the cost cost perspective, retirement can only be increased if greater fees are paid, and fees can only be increased if the funding amounts rise. And unfortunately, there's no market where independent performing artists can sell their services at a serviceable market rate. But the funders don't see themselves in the position of being able to increase the fees. Nor do the politicians through higher overall funding amounts. And they say that if they are forced to do this, there would be fewer projects that would be funded, and that the projects are art funding. They do not see any kind of socio political obligation with their funding decisions. And with Neustart Kultur, a debate was started about the necessity of better funding for the field. And the fee matrix that was passed in October 2020 is a step in this direction. And I'll talk about these, I'll name these once more so we keep them in our heads. I'm not going to provide any representative evidence, but, but these uh, fields of action are, one, access to voluntary unemployment insurance for freelancers, a model for basic old age security that is correct for the, that, that, that is appropriate for the money the artists need to live on, and opening the Kazka to additional professional groups as well as making it easier to combine Kazka with hybrid employment and slash or non-artistic supplementary income. Good. Okay. Thank you very much.
herzlichen Dank an Hannah Speicher für diese wirklich oh, thank you very much to Hannah Speicher for this really not only interesting but Schön ist ja, dass alle truly um, further taking presentation. It's important that we all find our representations. We're all in the right place here. Okay. Not everything we hear is motivating, but it's important that we come together and want to continue working. Okay, next comes Dr. Verena Tops on stage. She has worked as a business researcher for more than 20 years on a freelance basis, and she creates international comparisons of labor markets and typical properties, as well as social safeguarding, that which you already heard very much about. And, and she uses quantitative data of official and non-official statistics. She was one of the co-founders of INIS in Berlin, and the BFDK hired exact, precisely this institution, institution to do the quantitative analysis. Welcome, Verena Tops. Please give her a warm round of applause. We're running just a little late, so we're going to try to do this in 25 minutes. Let's see if we can. Okay, thank you very much. We've learned a lot about the depth, uh, the in-depth knowledge of forms of employment, subjective perspectives, how people work in the independent performing arts. Here, we're not trying to talk so much about explaining things or providing exemp exemplary examples, but showing how often we find these forms of employment, how frequently this uh, occur. This is also very interesting for politics. Because then they'll say, oh, do we need a new law? Do we need a new reform? It's if the COSCA has something similar to unemployment insurance, um, politics want to say it's affect 1,000 people or 10,000 people. And here, the quantitative analysis can really help. Shortly, uh, briefly, I'd like to t uh, talk to you a little bit about the design of the quantitative study. It's not only a special field, but it's a special challenge to deal with the special nature of the professions and the way that the income works. We can't work here with standardized statistical forms. It's very few people that fit those patterns within the independent performing arts. But the way in which we ask our questions is also not suitable. So we had to be innovative and develop new um, interview questions or new survey questions. Thank you very much to everyone who did participate in our survey. Oh, yeah, right. I had to check a large number of boxes. I brought a large number of graphics with me, but due to the but due to the time constraints, I'll just deal with a few important points right now. But I'm here all day, so if you have questions, please feel free to approach me. And at the end, I'll let you know how things will go on because these are only interim results. Okay, who did we want to survey? Um, well, the people who are the focus of steam check, um, freelancers, and the hybrid employed in the performing arts. So these were persons that were surveyed. And we don't know, actually, how many people work in the performing arts in Germany. It remains unclear. It's difficult to make an exclusive representation analysis, but we did use some metho methodical tools that should help us with the, uh, to make quantitative statements. The survey was conducted from mid-April to mid-June, over two months. The Bundesverband Freie Stunde Kunst, the German Federal Association of Independent Performing Arts, helped us to find people to fill out the survey. 
and had a large campaign via social media, uh, social media as well as with the state associations for the independent performing arts. And we also needed a control, uh, a way to make sure that people didn't simply take part in the survey even though they didn't belong to the population we were surveying. The survey took place um, online with personalized links. I'll mention it again because it's an important instrument that that allowed people to start to fill it out, take a break, pick it back up later. They could do it on their telephone, on a tablet, on a computer. And the data that was already entered was sa saved and stored, and we were making sure that people were able to take breaks and start again without having to start over. We also wanted to make sure that those being surveyed would be able to receive the completed survey in PDF form. It served as a motivation. How do we get to where we are? Where did the people come from? How did their professional life change over time? And were there, were there kinds of breaks or breakthroughs and what kind of types are there? Um, we did re reply, uh, we did rely in some ways on established measuring instruments such as uh, the microcensus, which has been used for more than 25 years, but we also used and developed some of our own things that I will show in order to be able to make, uh, in order to account for the special nature of the field. Um, we developed a life history calendar that uh, we then adapted to the group that we're examining here. Uh, we had two language versions, German and English. Uh, the respondents were able to choose themselves. The only mandatory question the only obligatory question was the year of birth because we needed that in order to, to be able to make our life history calendar. I'll show you briefly how we managed to put all this information together. We had a couple of subjective indica indicators as well. Okay. So then we had the challenge of classifying, the, uh, classifying or assigning the people to specific uh, professional groups and speaking with the production management as well as with the university, what types of professions are there? And we identified um, 38 or 39 different fields. Um, so a trainer in the field of performing arts, performer, actor, curator, circus artist. We combined some groups, but we also provided the option of other profession in the performing arts and other activity, neither performative nor artistic. People didn't have to uh, decide on one. Instead, they had the opportunity to structure them in, this is my primary activity, this is my second most frequent activity, this is my third most frequent activity. And that proved to be a very good choice. Everything in terms of employment, not simply for a first primary and a second secondary, but a maximum of four different types of employment or income that have been conducted in the last month. And this was also absolutely necessary in order to be able to, um, to display the diversity And with each of these, we asked, um, were you, with these income situations, were you, were you handled on a, were you 
where you're handling health insurance, care insurance, uh, retirement insurance, um, publicly, privately through the COSCA, et cetera. Um, for the way that their life is developed, we needed the birth year. And then we used this we used the survey to calculate how old the person was in beginning at the age of 18. We asked the questions what happened in terms of personal events and as well as historical events, um, how they were employed, how they were socially insured, what they earned, but in order to set an anchor, what was going on when I was 18, we gave ourselves the effort of, of searching out important events for each of these age groups. I brought an example with me, setting a cognitive anchor to remind the person, oh, when, what, what was going on when I was 18 or when I was between 18 and 25? Um, so we always chose a political as well as a cultural slash personal event. And they all had to be composed due to the age. Margaret Thatcher became the first female prime minister in Europe, and it was also the time of the Islamic Revolution and the creation of the Islamic Republic. And musically, the time of the new German wave and John Lennon from the Beatles was shot in New York. Those were important things. And below that, there's something about Helmut Kohl, and we tried to be a little bit. Um, we also tried to be. Uh, we also tried to be a little bit international because not all the respondents were German or had German history in mind. And then we have the personal events. I moved out, a child was born, a marriage took place. Employed, unemployed, um, cause, ka, private or nothing in terms of insurance, and estimated income per year. And in terms of uh, the results of the survey, we had um, nearly 1,700 participants. Of these 1,661, 864 people at least started the questionnaire. And with online surveys, we expect 10 to 20 percent for those where people sign up in advance, you get about 30 percent completion rate. So these figures are actually fantastic. To have 864 people that could begin to go into details, and the questionnaire was very, very long, particularly the biography. A 70-year-old person had to fill in multiple seven-year slots. And so nearly 500 people managed to make it through all the way to the end. And because you could save it, it was also a little bit difficult to evaluate. But still, 30% 30 of the respondents, uh, we have complete data from. Mm -hmm. We also paid attention to where did they stop. It's not, it's not particularly dramatic, but often they stopped with the questions of income and social security contributions. Yeah. And say it was a solid presentation, but since we still don't know what the actual target group is, it's, but we can still say that we have a pretty diverse coverage, and we had at least 1,700 interested parties. Uh, there's a reason why so many people participated. When signing up for the survey, you could say what you're concerned with, and the majority said um, old age retirement preservations. 
We also left some fields open and don't just indicate this applies or this doesn't apply or enter a year. We provided open fields. We will freely formulate their results. And right at the end, there was another um, opportunity for people to choose their own words to express what they wanted to us to know. And yeah. And 90% indicated barriers that they have encountered, and many people said, yeah, too little geld, no possibilities for, sa for safeguarding. They really took advantage of this opportunity to enter free text. It's definitely an indication that the topic is relevant amongst the people that we talk to, and it's, a, it's important to everybody that we talk to. We also... We also offered the respondents that they could receive a PDF with their answers, and 39% asked for that. Okay, and here are the results. And here's the socio, 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 social demographics. About 59% female identifying, about 2% diverse. That is on either male nor female. 90% of the respondents were German citizens. And a few more did use the German version, although several did use the English. Another marker of diversity is the Suordnung. Is the, um, is the information regarding black, indigenous, and people of color, and about 10% of the respondents uh, belong to that category, those categories. In terms of the age distribution, it's relatively identical to the overall German population. You can see the age pyramid. The average age of the respondents was 44. The majority was between 30 and 39. And a smaller proportion from, from, four, from 24 to 29, but also, but also people who've reached legal age of retirement with a category of 66 to 74, about 3%. Okay, here we can see professions, and when we combine them or evaluate them individually, um, primarily we have actors in the sample. The very dark bar that you can see in the picture, that's at least 20% of the people we spoke with. I am first and foremost in my perception an actor. And there were also some that said, and, with tw and we get up 27% when we add in those that say it's the secondary or the tertiary profession. How many actors do we have in Germany? Well, you have to ask. Well, I'm not going to read everything in this graphic aloud, but what I want to show you is that all of our 39 different professional fields were represented more or less within the survey. Sometimes as first profession, sometimes second, sometimes third, but this is exactly why it was important to ask so many diverse questions. Um, nine out of ten people we asked uh, indicated at least two professions, and uh, seven out of ten indicated at least three. In terms of disciplines, it was pretty similar. The disciplines that people worked with, uh, classical spoken word theater, as well as dance, were in the fir were in the first place. And you could also say first, second, and third. And it's pretty similar to as it was with professions. Everything here is pretty diverse, as well as the disciplines in which one conducted these fields. Eight out of ten worked in at least two fields, and six out of ten in at least three. In terms of the current income situation in the last month, which was just a pretty clear time period for people, uh, as a contrast to other representative studies, in our sample, 96% uh, were earning money, and when we asked how 
We asked how many different types of income did you have in the last month. More than half had at least two jobs. And a third had three jobs and more. 44% had done one job, and that means the rest had at least two. Here as well, uh, this is a challenge to show this complexity in the quantitative survey. And for four of these income situations or income activities, we said, what did you do, what did you earn, and when you combine these with each other, then you see this. 20% of people were hybridly employed. Hybrid means uh, employed and with an employer making uh, social security contributions as well as freelance work. We have a very large amount of freelancers and also a relatively high, high amount of people working in a few different fields on a freelance basis. Forty-two percent saying I've done one activity as a freelancer and that's what I did. Uh, Twenty-five percent said I was an actor in an independent group, but I also worked as a theater educator, but could also be in a completely different field. What does this image mean? Well, we definitely have an impression how many people are we talking about that work with hybrid employment and what looks like freelance with one activity and freelance with more activities. We could also say, though, we've definitely reached our target groups, uh, those hybridly employed and freelancers. Now I want to talk a little bit about the current social insurance situation. How are the people we spoke with insured in terms of health care and retirement insurance? The bars that you see here are next to each other because it was possible to give multiple answers in the survey. Um, for example, um, in the last four weeks, maybe you worked uh, the last two, the first two weeks uh, as a part-time employee, and then you changed your jobs. In the last two weeks, you worked on a freelance basis. That would be sequentially hybrid, but it could also be that there are overlaps, and that would be synchronous hybrid employment within one month. And this is why we can't really combine the bars, and that's why we reach more than 100%. What, what's my point? 54% uh, enjoy legal insurance protection. And this is sort of the same in terms of cost cost for all three types of insurance. But, but the majority, or almost all, are taken care of in some way, shape, or form. A, a small amount is also privately insured. Now, if we just look at retirement insurance, and you see the same image, the colors are the same, um, legally insured, cost cost, privately insured, not insured, and people who are freelance and multiple freelance and hybridly employed, then we see that, and we see that the majority of those hybridly employed enjoy legal insurance protection and probably don't have a chance for their other income to bring them or to keep them into the Costco. And let's go to another level, and this is health insurance, care insurance, and retirement insurance uh, for the overall group, and these are the average monthly contributions. Everybody has insurance, but how well are they insured? And, well, we knew this already, but I'm still going to show you the numbers, and these numbers you can rely on. So, health insurance. Those who are legally insured um, pay on average 246 euros a month, and that's significantly less by the Casca. That's also a function, perhaps, of a lower income, but it could also be a different uh, percentage. And for those privately insured, um, the number's higher because they also play the employer uh, contribution. 
and here we see with the retirement insurance, 236 for the legally insured, 148 for CASCA, and 339 for private, for private, a, that are going to end up bringing a secure uh, retirement, and that's the point. And then we asked, um, do you have your own reserves and assets for old age? Is there private retirement insurance? Uh, the Versorgungskasse, but also other places. Uh, 18% of respondents have some kind of capital life insurance, but that's but the saved capital is a little bit less under 50,000 euro. We also asked about the insured amount, and it's also not much higher. It's 55,000 euros, and the question is whether you can live with it. These is also newer, uh, only on average. The other reserves. And this is relatively interesting. The other reserves, it's relatively interesting. 56% of the people we talked to said that they have other reserves. And on the right-hand side, you can see how they are divided. They could give multiple answers, so there are overlaps. 22% said, I have an inheritance. 40% uh, have saved capital, have saved assets, um, real estate or securities in the average uh, other reserves, about 116,000 euros. But, but we can't say how this divides into the carefree, the careless, etc. Finally, I also have subjective indicators, uh, also in quantitative research. In social research, it's, it's important to work with hard facts. But we should also look at how the people feel. How do they perceive it? How do they deal with this? And we have a few indicators. And to what extent do you worry about certain areas? So we, we had three categories, um, old age provisions, the, your own current economic situation, and the security of your job. And not only those who are dependently employed or uh, formerly employed, but also the freelancers. And a lot of people are very, very, very worried, um, are worried about their retirement. Uh, not so many people are worried about their own economic situation. And also the security that one's own job is average. And we asked, will your retirement be sufficient in the future? And we see a similar thing, 90% said, 70% 70 said, yes, yes, but it'll be very tight. Sorry, sorry. Almost 75% said, no, my retirement will not be enough at any rate. And about 16% said, yeah, but things are going to be tight. What's interesting, in contrast, um, the question, how long do you and will you continue to work in your job, um, we think this is a combination of I really want to do it and many people feel like they have to do it um, and the majority said they were going to work until the ages until between the ages of 65 and 75 so here we come to a summary. The survey worked very, very well. A lot of things point to that. We definitely have more in-depth insight. Um, we know that people do different jobs in different fields. We know that they're worried about their retirement. We know that there's a great deal of concern about how far retirement will reach in old age. And what else are we going to do? We are going to work with these life history calendars. We need to evaluate and analyze them in order to identify patterns that we can then use for uh, topologies. All of this is called a sequential analysis. Thank you very much.